Hey everyone, TNT here. All right, so we're continuing on with the YZ490 build. Today we're going to be Cerakoting the engine block, and we're going to be using this product right here, Cerakote Arctic Black. This is a non-catalyst paint. It's an oven bake, and it has special properties of dissipating heat. So it's perfect for an air-cooled engine. Now a little bit of history about that bottle I got sitting right there. Last year when COVID hit, it made it almost impossible for me to get anything out of the United States shipped up to Canada. I reached out to Cerakote and let them know that I was interested in purchasing one of their products, this one in particular, to be using on this current YouTube build. Cerakote made it possible to get this bottle shipped up to me here in Canada so that I could use it on my build. I'm sorry to Cerakote that it's taken so long for me to get at doing this. It's almost been a full year. But with the move and everything, uh, there was just nothing I could do about it. So today, we're going to test this out. We're going to see how well it works. And I have no doubt that it's going to be an exceptional product. All right, so let's move on. Okay, to use this Cerakote product, we're going to be using an HVLP gun. This one here is made by Mastercraft. Uh, it's sold in Canadian Tire. It's not an expensive unit at all. And for me, it was even less expensive because I uh, actually won it off of a, a Facebook uh, bidding war site, I think, for about 10 bucks for the whole setup. Now, I have um, put some water through it. I have put some acetone through it just to see how it works. And it seems to all be work, working perfectly fine. Um, and basically what you do is you just put your paint in the top. Of your container right here if you've never used, used an HVLP gun and then make your adjustments on the fan of the paint and how much uh, volume of paint comes through with this dial and then down here you got a pressure dial as well as your pressure gauge and we got a little water filter right there we're also going to be using this filter here um, to filter the paint when we're pouring it into the top there and then inside here, it also has another mesh filter. Now, Cerakote suggests to use a 100 micron filter to use their product. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a specific 100 micron filter like they have on their uh, website that you place right inside here. So that's why we're going to be using this throwaway disposable one. Uh, right now, I've got the parts sitting in the oven. So let's just turn this around over here right there we've got half of the engine case sitting in the oven baking trying to get any moisture or grease or oils or anything to come out to the surface where we can use acetone to remove them over here we have one that i have already run through the oven these were sandblasted uh a year ago by somebody uh out here in chilliwack he did a fantastic job um, just letting this cool down now. I don't want to touch it with my bare hands because you'll wind up getting uh, oils from your hands on it. I'm going to put on some uh, nitro gloves here in a bit. And I'm going to throw it in a container and take acetone and clean it right up. Once I'm done cleaning it right up, we'll be applying some heat proof tape to the different areas inside the case that I do not want to get paint on. Um, there are some spots like where the seal goes, where the bearing goes. You have tolerance uh, issues there where you don't want to uh, cause anything to be tight or not fit properly or even leak. All right, well, we'll now keep moving along. We'll mask this off with our heat proof tape. Okay, so now we're just going to tape off this spot right here and right there. And that'll probably be the only spots that we really need to tape. Okay, now we're ready to uh, hook up the spray gun and see how this paint works. The first thing I'm going to do is just hook up the gun and get what feels to be a good air pressure. Oh, that cranked up a little bit too fast. 
you want to uh, set it up for about 30 psi so we'll just hold it open and bring the gauge out until it reads 30 there we go 30 psi now you want to shake this up really well I'm not exactly sure how much of this that I need but because I have to let it sit for an hour I'm going to try not to put too much paint into the gun try that right there what we're going to do first is we're just going to try sample spraying on here that's quite a big fan to it I think I'm going to drop that down. I think we just go with a little bit more paint. Then we need to turn it around. All right guys, well that's it. Let's slide it in the oven. Okay guys, the first piece is out of the oven. It's been 60 minutes now. Just have a look at it. Now it's supposed to cure for 24 hours. Just having a look at it. It's got um, kind of like a little bit of a blotchy look to it. And I'm thinking that is probably my fault being as this is the first time I've ever done this looks like I missed a little bit of paint down in there all right guys so what you're seeing unfortunately I did not have on camera uh, my battery had died by the time I finally figured out what I was doing wrong with painting the Cerakote that uh, I had to go along and finish it all up without it being on camera but it looks absolutely amazing so what I was doing wrong is it was actually my gun uh, the pressure that I had on my gun was way too low to be painting this and it was basically splattering the paint on and once I figured out that I had to jack the pressure way up it was giving me a nice even film of paint now any imperfections that you might see on the metal here um, is not paint like so you see that right there that is not paint that's actually the metal that's how thin this paint goes on it just super thin and you can see the imperfections. It's not like powder coat where it hides it. So if you have any imperfections that, you know, you don't want showing through the paint, you're going to have to clean those up before you put Cerakote on it because uh, it will reveal everything that is underneath the paint. But it is absolutely amazing how this stuff lays down. Absolutely amazing. I am so happy with the way that this turned out and i'm definitely going to be using cerakote lots in the future well guys uh it turns out i actually missed a piece so we are going to get to see uh this gun spring at its proper pressure and i'm just going to do a little uh sample spray into the filter there just to make sure yeah that looks pretty good Quite happy with that so I don't know if you guys could hear or see the pressure there but there was considerably more pressure so here we go pretty good and 
that does it. Time to get it in the oven. It's not finish. Is Cerakote has an amazing finish on it. And once you've got your gun set up right, you've got your prep done right, it, uh, it just looks so good. It's so easy to use. And there we go, 60 minutes. All right, let's get back over here and get to tidying this whole area up so that we can get ready to build this motor. All right, guys, so we're gonna move on to honing out the cylinder now. We got our flex hone, we got our WD-40 that we're going to be used for cutting and cleaning, and then we've got our variable speed drill. All right, so slow and fast. You're going to be using about half the RPM of that drill. Now, you don't have to be worried about using a flex hone on a two-stroke cylinder. They're somewhat designed for this purpose. They're not going to damage your ports in any way or anything like that. A lot of people talk about how it can damage your ports. It's not going to damage your ports. There are other hones out there, three, four stone uh, hones that you can use, but I've been using a flex hone now on all my two-stroke cylinders and I've had absolutely zero issues. WD-40 works just fine. Um, on this particular hone, the site suggests using um, 10W30 motor oil, which is if that's what you have, go ahead and use it. It's nice and inexpensive, but uh, I'm going to be using WD-40. We're going to be making about um, a dozen passes in from the top. Okay, so that's it. Let's hook up the hone, get some WD-40 in here, and uh, get this thing ready for installation. Okay, so start by spinning it and then inserting it. Alright, so that was about 10 times. Okay, well, we got a good crosshatch pattern going on in there now. Let's see if you guys can see it. Hopefully, you guys can see it. Should provide good lubrication for the piston. Now we're going to have to completely wash this out with soap and water. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is make sure that you got all your necessary tools to get this done. You don't want to be scrambling once you've heated this up and, and you're going to put your bearings in there looking for something to drive that bearing in. So make sure you got your appropriate size seal bearing driver, a uh, good hammer, and you've got a torch to heat it up. That's about all that's required for putting these bearings in. After that, you're going to want to make sure that you got some sort of an assembly lube that you're going to be putting on things as you're putting it together. Um, a red thread locker, a blue thread locker, and then in this case, there's no center gasket, so I'll be using a Yama bond or a three bond as a center gasket for it. Okay, so let's get this heated up and uh, then we will install the bearings. All right, so I got my handy dandy heat gun here. It's telling me that my metal is currently at uh, 70 degrees. We're going to warm it up to about uh, 245. Okay, so your bearing should have numbers or letters on one side. Keep those facing up. Should hopefully just drop right in there. They don't always drop right in there. And there we go. Should drop right in. That's always nice when that happens so you don't have to bang on it. 
Just got a little towel here, just clean up a bunch of the moisture. Just gonna have a look at the other side and make sure that that bearing seated in all the way, and it did. Now, hopefully this one drops in just as easy as the last one did. And yes, it did. Perfect. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and install the transmission bearings inside the case. So. We've got the um, bearing over here that is part of the gear set. And then we've got one down here, which is the uh, shift drum bearing. And then we've got the main output shaft bearing over there. There's these two here just sit inside there, um, a heated fit. And then this one over here has a small holder that goes on that side. So this is going to be the same thing, a little bit of heat. Uh, the two smaller bearings are of identical size, um, I, so I don't need to worry about which one goes where. First thing I'm going to do is get my bearing seal driver set up for these smaller bearings. want to make sure that while I've got the heat on there in the cold, that if it doesn't quite go in right, I can still hammer it in place quick. Okay, we got that all ready. Let's just warm this up a little bit. That's now in place. That one there actually took a little bit to get it in there. Make sure that everything's going to be spinning freely, sitting flat. I think I'm going to put a little bit more heat to uh, the next one. It's going in nice and straight, but it is a very tight fit. Same thing with this one. Pretty sure it's all the way down. Make sure everything's turning freely. It's all turning well. Okay, now we move on to the last one. All right, so the final bearing for this side is a clutch actuator arm bearing. And it has no flat side to it. Sometimes these bearings like this, uh, they'll have a flat side on it that allows you to hammer onto it. Um, this one does not which kind of concerns me because I don't have a tool that I can use for this. So what I may wind up doing is uh, I may wind up using a socket of the appropriate size to slide down inside here because when you hammer on these things it can cause this outer race to actually close in on the inner cage you should probably have a tool that slides inside and matches the outside.
Well, guys, I must say that was a bit of a challenging bearing to get in there. Never expected it to be that difficult. Moves freely, it's sitting flat, but uh, all of these bearings seem to be an extremely tight fit. Um, I haven't experienced that in most of the Hondas that uh, I've assembled. They usually go in a lot easier than that. I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but definitely makes it a challenge to be able to get them in and out of the bike. All right, moving on to the last couple of bearings that go into this side of the case. This is the other transmission bearing, the output shaft bearing for the inside. And once again, finding things to be uh, not just sliding right down inside. That sounds like it right there. Let's flip it over and have a look. Tight up against the stops, so that side's good. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is install the crank seals. Now I actually had to go on to a YZ490 forum because uh, I've never built a Yamaha motor like this before and some of the diagrams online and information is not thorough enough to get a good idea of how some of these things go together. Uh, these crank seals have notches on them like this and you wouldn't suspect that that would go inwards towards the bearing i'm not exactly sure why it does that but that is the way that it goes so these notches here they go down towards the bearing and you want to keep your seal so that it sits flush with the top of this surface right here so i'm just going to put a little bit of regular engine oil or transmission oil a little bit too much there on the outside of my seal just like that line it up start to push it in by hand mm being careful of that spring. Once again, it's got notches on it. It's got a, a metal piece actually on the inside of this one. Just get a little bit of transmission oil, put it on the outside of that. Get it started by hand if you can. And if you can't, at least get it so that it's flat inside. That's good right there. Okay, we'll move on to installing the shift drum now. Now the shift drum has these little tabs that you just have to align this so that it goes in in the right spot and then the bearing should just simply slide right in there this is not a, a pressure fit or anything it's just a matter of lining that up so that these forks will fit through Hmm, but the bearing does seem to be a little bit tight. That's all lining up. Oh, there we go. Just use a rubber mallet right here and just give it a tap. And there we go. She snapped in. 
everything spins nice and freely. Okay, now we're going to install the shift drum stopper. It's uh, got this little cam arm like this with a spring that sits in behind it. And then it's got this bolt with a bit of a, a lip on it here. Okay, so you're going to want to put some blue thread locker on this. You could use red, but I don't think it's necessary for this. There's not a lot of torque that's going to be happening on this bolt. So a little bit, a little bit of blue thread locker is fine. Get the cam so that it's facing the right direction. Uh, it's this larger face of this rivet that sticks up. Stick your bolt through the spring. Sits like that. Now once you get it down here on top of that post, you just get the bolt started. in a little ways. Get it so that it, it's just sitting up against that cam so that it won't move, a, move around too much. Now take that lower part of the spring, make sure that your shift drum notch is facing over here at the notch in the case. Just push that spring down. All right, there we go, we got that spring down. Now we're just gonna push this cam over and in behind the notch in the shift drum, and we are in position. We can now go ahead and tighten this up. So now you gotta remember, you've got that ridge on the back side of this bolt that has to go down inside that cam hole. So you just gotta manipulate it around a little bit There we go. If you don't make sure that you get that ridge going down inside the hole of this cam, you'll know right away because the cam will start to twist up and you'll see that it's not freely moving. I'm gonna put about 15 pounds of torque on there by hand and now I'm just going to show you by turning the shift drum on the other side you can see the cam snaps right back no problem and allows the shift drum to lock into position so that it won't shift out of gear all right so that's it for this side now uh, we're going to move to installing the crankshaft all right, so moving on to installing the crank. Normally I would use my Tusk crank installer, um, but in this case, I cannot. Now I'm gonna show you why. Now the Tusk installer requires a bolt that goes into the end of the crank. And on the YZ490, they don't use a bolt. They actually um, put their nut, or pardon me, they, they put their, their sprocket on with a nut, which doesn't allow me to be able to hook onto the crank to be able to pull it through in any way. So what we're going to have to do is I am going to have to hammer this down. Hopefully it's not going to require an immense amount of force. And I don't think that it's going to be much of an issue. We're already down almost in oh well, there you go look at that we're in already so i was able to actually physically push it down and everything is moving smoothly so we can now get this mounted onto the engine stand and proceed to install the transmission Okay guys, so one thing you want to make sure is once you've got this um, shift drum in position, I'm just going to turn this around a little bit here so you guys can see it. 
is in order to get the transmission in, um, that shift drum has to be in a certain position and you want to get it into neutral. If you have a look here, up nice and close, it's got this notch right, right there. That notch sits on that cam and that's neutral. In between every one of these stars uh, points is a gear, right? So you got four gears, one, two, three, four, even though there's um, six positions on there, it won't actually shift to a couple of those other positions. It literally shifts uh, to first, second, third, fourth, and then these two, It the drum won't allow it to get there. So make sure that you've got this little divot right there on your cam stopper, your shift drum stopper cam. So now we'll turn it back around. If you don't have it lined up there, you may get your transmission in, but you probably won't. It gets uh, very difficult to be able to, to line it up if you don't have the grooves in your shift drum in the right spot. All right, so get a hold of your two gear sets like this. Get your shift forks in, line them up. Oh, I got that shift fork on backwards. So let's turn that around. Make sure you haven't mixed them up. They're all numbered. This one here has a number two on it. It's going to go on this side. You get that clutch side part of the transmission started. And then the drive side. Get it to go into its hole down there. I might have pushed the, the clutch side in a little bit too far. Got to get these started right. So there we go. We got it started. And yeah, we dropped one of our shifting forks. So let's pick that up. Oh, this never goes as easy as you would hope it to. You need like five hands in order to do this. Now you can see I've got it going in on a bit of an angle. It doesn't work. It needs to go in nice and straight up and down. The gears have to mesh together. There we go. And then you should be able to get your shift fork to slide into position allowing your gears to all drop in. There we go. Now these pins here have a little groove in it. Groove goes down. That one in. Get this one lined up. Just going to turn this up right now. So I can see it down inside there. First pin in. Those gears to mesh, there we go. And we're good. Just like that. Spinning freely. There are two washers back on there. The thrust washers. Bring it down to about there. We want to make sure that it doesn't fall out on us. All right, we're gonna put a little bit of lube on the gears. We're just going to give them a spin. Now I'm just going to change the gears here. Make sure that all of the shifting is working well. All right, before we put the tri-bond on and put the case together, we got one more piece that we need to put in here. This is just a, a little bearing holder. So there you go, just like that. Sits right in there. Tighten that up. Now we're going to give it a good whack with an impact driver.
Okay, we're ready to put the other case half on. Got a bit of tri-bond all over the place here. This stuff is sticky and stringy. We'll have to clean that up later. Well, hopefully everything is going to line up for me here. I'm going to try tapping it down over here. There we go. What's going on now? Hopefully. Everything lines up with the transmission. So now we're, we are going to use the special engine crank installer. Simply put that special nut on that they give you. And you've got this piece right here that Simply threads on like that. Then you've got this piece. It slides over top. Now that just pushes up against the case. And you take this nut. And just start cranking it together. Hopefully, it all goes on nice and smooth. It's going on there real well. One of the big issues that you have to watch out for is your line up here at the back, and that those rods for your shifting forks start to go in the case properly. Yeah, and everything feels good. Very handy tool. I've put motors together without using one of these before and you you gotta hammer it down and you gotta take your bolts and put them in part way and just kind of work your way around. This is a way better way to do it. Great tool. All right, just finishing up putting the bolts in. These are stainless steel bolts. The OEM bolts, um, we're just gonna be way too much money all right we'll just spin the motor around and uh, install the crank drive sprocket so this one requires a key got to watch and make sure that you don't lose that when you first assemble it make sure you put a little bit of oil either on your sprocket or on your seal in here before you install it okay now that we've got the seal all lubed the outside of the seal surface of the sprocket lube we're just going to put the sprocket on i'm not going to put the key in right now i'll put the key in after this can be a little bit challenging to get this sprocket to go in that seal sometimes there we go And it is all the way in. Now we'll just take that key. And hopefully insert it. Should just slide right in there. There we go. All right, now our lock washer goes in behind that and then our nut in behind that. And this thing gets torqued to some pretty high torque. I don't know what the torque specs are on it right now, so I'm not going to tighten it right up. I'm just going to tighten it by hand um, 
because I've got no way to really hold the crank in place while I tighten this up. And then once the clutch assembly and everything is on there, I'll stick uh, copper washers between the gears and then we'll get this nut tightened up completely. Okay, next we're going to install this plate right here, which we're going to put some thread locker on these. We're going to go with red thread locker on this stuff. This is another bolt you definitely don't want coming off. When I tighten this nut up, I'm going to make sure that I take it off and put some thread lock on there. If anybody else knows what this plate might be for, go ahead and leave a comment. All right, now we're gonna put the bearing cover on. This one here holds the main transmission shaft that connects to the clutch. Holds it inside the case so it can't ever come out. We'll make sure we red thread lock all of these. All right, so we're going to install the idler sprocket now. Now, this sprocket has basically a flat side to it and an indented side to it. You want this indented side facing outwards. You should have two thrust washers. Go ahead and install one of them. I'll just put a little bit of assembly lube here on the shaft. that on there give it a few spins get that lube all over the place then you will have another thrust washer that goes on the outside and then you are going to have your snap ring that's much better it's in the groove all the way around now Okay, now we'll move on to installing the Kickstarter gear. Some assembly lube up in there. All right, with the assembly lube on there, now on the back you've got this tab, and then you've got this spring. The tab's going to fit right up in here. The spring's going to fit right down inside there. So just start by guiding that in. See if you can get a better view of it over here. Get that tab up there, spring there, slide it past and into position. Then you take your spring, bring it around and slide it right in that hole right there. And that's it, it's in there. So even though I don't have the seal on the other side for the shift lever in place, you can't put the clutch on without having this on. I'll be able to get the seal over top of the shaft and into the motor on the other side, no problem when I receive it. So we will just install this. This has got a little uh, uh, post right here. That post slides inside of these two springs. Makes it real simple to install. There's only one spot it can go. It just snaps into place just like that. Now we will go ahead and put a little bit of lube on this sprocket and a little bit on the idler sprocket and we are on to the clutch assembly okay guys i think i'm gonna have to stop right there until i get the seals uh just looking the way that this clutch system works because the clutch arm is on the far side um, this rod here actually goes through and on the other side you've got your clutch actuator that goes up against it like that and then as you turn it it pushes it 
Um, the problem with that is if I go ahead and install this rod, I will never be able to get that clutch arm down inside there in behind this. So I'm going to have to stop the engine assembly right there and wait until I get the seals. All right, guys, we're back working on the YZ490 motor. The seals are in. Sorry this is taking so long. Life has really uh, gotten in the way a few times from a uh, broken wrist to last year taking the end of my finger off. And then I've got some other things that I've had going on and it's really stalled out the project. This, is <laughs> this has been the longest and uh, just craziest build I've ever done. Uh, Hopefully nothing like this ever happens again. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and install the clutch arm seal. I'm just gonna get a little bit of oil. I'm gonna pump out on the outside and the inside of that seal. Now well, sometimes you can get lucky, you just press that in by hand and that one is going in by hand. Just got to get it to go down a little bit further. So I'm going to get uh, my seal driver. It's not flush with the outside of the bearing in there yet. It's flush with the outside of the housing, but I want it to, oh, there we go. I actually got it to move down by hand. Now, we can go ahead and put the clutch actuator on there. Now, to try and remember how this thing goes on. Got my washer. I'm not sure if the washer, yeah, the washer does go right on top. And then we've got the spring, which goes like that and the actuator which goes like that slide that down it's got a little notch over here on the side of the case where it sits and that's as far down as it goes right there yeah it's working perfect okay the next one we're going to do is the seal for the shifting arm I'm just going to slide the shifting arm back this bike in particular i've used more oem parts on it than any other build I've ever done. And the reason for that is, is you just can't get aftermarket parts for this bike at all. They're just not available. Get that shift shaft back into position. Hopefully it goes right into that seal. No problem, it doesn't push it out. Yeah, there we go. And move back to installing the clutch and we're just going to use regular oil here and we'll put a little bit of engine assembly on the sprocket here I know this was a real tight fit. There we go. All right, we are on. And everything looks good as far as clearance for the sprocket. Over on this side, it is not touching the um, idler sprocket that goes between the Kickstarter gear and the clutch gear. So. Okay, there we go. There we go. Starting to think that it was a bad idea to give away my half inch torque wrench to my son. I may have to get that back. Make sure that everything's moving nice and freely. Now we'll move on to installing the 
clutch basket. This one does have a thrust washer that goes there. And then the inner clutch basket. Okay, now we'll go ahead and install the clutch friction and clutch plates. These have all been sitting in oil for a long time. This is nice clean engine oil. First one is a friction plate. And that is it. We are on to the last friction plate. Okay, the next part is the clutch actuator rod. Now this rod is identical on both sides. Go like that. Not in place. Now the ball bearing goes down inside. Okay, so the next part is right here. I'm not exactly sure what they call this. Um, it is adjustable. So I think it's basically to take all the slack out. Um, this part here, they call it a screw uh, with an adapter. So it fits into a groove. Oh, sorry. <laughs> fits into a groove on the back here so that it cannot move around. And then on this side, you've got a washer and a nut. Now, make sure you can see right there that it has this adjuster right there. Adjust that right out so it's no longer showing. And then tighten the nut up just so that it's holding it in place so that it doesn't come out of that groove in the back, back there. And now you can install it. Oh, wait a sec. Look at that. I almost made a mistake. Um, that does not go on yet. I'm getting ahead of myself here. We have to install the nut for the inner basket. Let's find that. So here's our nut and here's our washer. And our washer is completely destroyed. And uh, luckily enough, for some reason, I ordered two of them. So this washer has the smaller tabs, they face down, and the bigger ones face up. And basically, you bend these bigger tabs up against the nut, and that locks it in place so it cannot move. There's actually little, uh, little divots inside here. If you look down inside there, you can see you've got a divot there, there, and there. And this washer fits right inside those just like that and then or not goes on all right we're going to be tightening up this nut to 58 pounds 58 foot pounds uh, we're going to be using a tusk clutch tool so you do have to be careful with this tool. Make sure that it's not um, too tight. Like you don't actually want these jaws clamping to that inner basket. You kind of just want them sitting inside of it. Okay, so I got my nut in a position where I can bend those tabs up. Now for this, I'm just gonna use a pair of pliers. Just hook the back of the nut and the edge of that tab and just bend it up. And this will make sure that if for some reason that nut were to try and come loose, it's not going to come off. 
Now I can go ahead and put my clutch all back in, which I'll probably never be able to line up again. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we're going to have to go one at a time again. Okay, we are now ready to install the pressure plate. All right, so moving on to the clutch springs. Now, when I took this bike apart, I was uh, one of the bolts was not an original. I meant to order one, and uh, for whatever reason, I forgot. So I'll be using one bolt in here that'll be um, different than the rest, but there's nothing wrong with it. It does the exact same thing. Uh, we'll be torquing these bolts to eight foot-pounds which I find to be a little bit light, but all right, to get the actuator rod in the right position because it has a, a rounded spot in the flat spot, right? So you want to get it on that flat spot. Bring it out to about here and now just start cranking it back until you'll feel it kind of stiffen up and no longer start to push back. Just turn it back a little bit from there and tighten the nut up. Yep. Just hold that adjusting screw in place while we tighten this up. This has a lock washer, so you don't really have to worry about putting any anti or um, any thread lock on it. Okay, so moving on to installing the outer cover now. We've got everything all buttoned up. I like to apply a bit of grease to either side of my gaskets reason being is if you ever have to open it up again you're probably going to be able to get it apart without damaging the gasket now before we go ahead and install this we'll just put the kickstarter seal in the outer cover now this one i may have to use a seal driver to get it in place okay we are almost there just a little bit on the edge And that's it. It is ready. Everything going to line up here. Feels a little bit tight. Shouldn't be anything constricting it. All right, well, still struggling with this cover. And all right, guys, so I figured out what happened. Um, so I had this spring. In the right spot inside the shaft there's a hole inside the shaft where the spring slides in but the bushing itself had come out and was no longer in the slot to allow the bushing to go all the way down there's a slot in that plastic bushing that slides over the spring so I got it couldn't understand what was going on there it just did not make sense at all so now the bushing is way farther back than what it was. And our cover should slide right on now. And there we go. No problem now. Is 
bolts do not require a lot of torque. You're probably putting about five pounds to each one of them. First off, we got the stator installed. These screws here, um, I'll actually be using an impact driver at the last stage just to lock them in place. One tap should be good. We are now at the Magneto. I actually had to order um, a new Magneto because mine um, had damage to the inside from when the nut backed off. Make sure you get this lined up perfectly with that key. You don't want to be tightening this thing on, not lined up with that keyway. All right, so this nut is supposed to get torqued on with, I think it's uh, about 35, 38 foot pounds. This one here is the one that came off on this bike, and I'm definitely going to be using red thread lock on this. Um, I do not want this to ever come off. Okay, we are good. All right, now we'll put on our front sprocket seal. Okay, moving on, putting the cylinder on. Um, this gasket has a special coating around the edge that will complete the seal between the cylinder and the block. Uh, it only goes on one way. The holes are actually larger on this side than they are on that side for the dowels. You do not apply any grease to this gasket. It has special stuff in it that once the engine heats up, it will actually bond itself to the case on the bottom and uh, the cylinder will complete a seal anyway. All right, so we'll go ahead and put the piston on now. I'm gonna be putting a Weissco piston in here. It is the same as the piston that was in here before. We're gonna need to gap the rings Sometimes they come pre-gapped from the factory, and other times they do not. So, do not use in chrome-plated cylinders. Check for proper ring end gap. Minimum recommended end gap is usually four thousandths of an inch per inch of bore. Alright, so we're going to take each ring and insert it into the cylinder we're going to slide this ring down inside about one inch and we'll use the piston to make sure that we get it in there nice and even just take the piston upside down make sure it's going in nice and straight and push that ring down inside the bore about one inch. Now 
we will measure that gap and see where we're at. So my cylinder in inches is roughly three point four five seven times point zero zero four my ring end gap is going to be fourteen thou so let's have a look here find my appropriate Wheeler gauge. I've got a 15 right there. Let's see if I can get that 15 to go in there. 15 goes. 16 does not, not go. So we're 15 thou. We're probably about uh, half a thou over what it should be, but it's not a problem. Um, I did not want to bore this cylinder out. I wanted to try and keep the uh, last of what was left of this bore diameter. So we're, we're only half a thou on our rings, which is fine. 15 thou instead of 14 and a half thou. Okay, so we can go ahead and install the rings onto the piston. Find our little markers, our little pins here and make sure we put the letters facing up. I got a pin right there. And there we go. All right. Now we're gonna wrap a towel around everything here because you don't want to drop anything down inside of your motor. So a two-stroke piston is pretty easy to identify which direction it goes in. Most of them will have a cutout in the back here, and that is your intake side. And this is your exhaust side. Plus, they also have an arrow stamped on top. Pin feels like it actually came lubricated from the factory. I think it did. So these pins are always fun. Um, and this one, they're way inside. They're really deep down inside there. Look at that. See how far in they are? So this is always lots of fun to get these in. Not have them go flying across the room. The two points are facing straight back from where this little hole is that you use to get that clip out of there. Make sure that that pin's going to slide all the way in there, no issues, and it does. Um, due to me having this shelf in my way here, uh, I'm going to have to install the cylinder on its side. So the first thing I'm going to do is lubricate up the inside of the cylinder with some two-stroke oil. rings back around in their pins and we are ready sometimes it can be a bit of a pain to get started
it. There we go. All right, guys, my apologies again. Uh, <laughs> I swear that I am cursed on this build, knock on wood, that I have zero issues once this whole thing is done. <clears throat> but my camera battery packed it in again while I was installing the cylinder head. Um, well, I guess right prior to that, right after I put that uh, head gasket on, the battery failed in the camera and I did the entire installation of the head um, not being on camera. So basically pretty simple, put the head on, uh, blue Loctite for all of the studs, washers, nuts, torque to 18 pounds on all the nuts, crisscrossing pattern as I'm torquing it down. And that's it. That's the installation of the head. Pretty basic. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and install the reeds and the intake boot. Now this reed cage is uh, identical in both directions. There's no difference. So it doesn't matter which way you insert it. We're just gonna put a little bit of blue Loctite on these bolts. Not that it really needs it. I don't think I've ever had one of these come out. Tighten these up to probably about, let's say it's about five to eight pounds. Don't need to go crazy on this. I just put this bushing on. Here, I'll take it back off. All right, so that bushing just slides right up in there like that. I've already got oil on that seal from when I installed it. All right, so now we'll put our sprocket on. We got our special washer, our brand new one. It's like a clutch washer. It's got tabs on it that you bend out around your nut. And then here we have our original nut. which is still in remarkable condition. You can tell the chain hasn't flown off of this bike too many times because the nut's in good shape and so is the case. You can now take the tabs and just grab them and squeeze them in. And the second side. All right. That nut is not coming off. We got the sprocket on there. Uh, I think we are done with what we can do with the motor. And it's time to put it in the bike. All right, I found one more piece we might as well throw on here right now. Might as well put the chain guard on. Pretty sure I'll easily be able to slide the chain through there. And really, you don't have a choice anyway because. This chain guard actually slides over top of the gear shift. Uh, let's throw some uh, blue Loctite on there first. Uh, maybe we'll also throw the shifter arm on at the same time. Well, that's interesting. Huh. How the heck are you supposed to get the bolt on? All right, guys. So quite a while back, I bought a uh, block off an 82 YZ490. And I just remembered that I had it. I've just removed the shift lever from it which looks to be the original shift lever and to my surprise <laughs> I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see that or not but the splines inside it 
look to be in perfect condition which means I'm going to be able to uh, take this rubber piece off, sandblast this unit, and get it all powder coated up and ready for this bike. So we are a win-win as far as the shifter goes because I can't find any online. All right, guys, so that completes the, uh, the assembly of the motor. I want to thank you guys for... You know putting through uh or sorry putting up with how long it's taken to get this build done i really apologize i've had a lot of things happen in my life over the last little bit and once um the bike is completely assembled i'll do another video and talk about what i've been doing over the last uh six months since we moved into this house and how it's disrupted this build along with uh some of the other things that disrupted uh this build as well all right, so I want to thank you all for coming out and watching, and uh, please leave some comments, share with your friends, subscribe if you're a new subscriber, and the next video will be installing this motor into the bike and hopefully firing it up for the first time. All right, catch you next video.